This video is sponsored by Dell XPS Laptops and NVIDIA Studio. More about them later. Hi everyone, I'm Evan Abrams, and in this video, we're gonna look at some basic ways to integrate and blend between 2D and 3D scenes when creating motion graphics pieces. This is meant to be a starting point to get you some foundational concepts by dissecting this lovely looping piece that we're having a look at while you're hearing my voice. We have basically four discrete scenes here that go from 3D to 2D, back to 3D again, back to 2D again, as we loop around to the start. We're going to be picking apart how this was made with Cinema 4D Lite and Adobe After Effects. And while we'll talk about some specific techniques and tools unique to those software packages, I hope that some of the general concepts will be useful if you're using other 3D and 2D apps and other compositors to bring it all together. If you have any questions, please do let me know in the comments and I'll try to help you out. And if you like learning this kind of thing, maybe subscribe to this channel. I've got new tutorials coming out all the time. So if you're looking to smoothly transition between 2D and 3D scenes in your motion design projects, let's make our own smooth transition into the tutorial. Before we open up any apps and start doing the work, I highly recommend we get a good plan in place. Even a rough sketch and some thumbnail sized storyboards can really make this process a lot smoother. And in particular, in our planning phase, we want to identify what scenes or compositions or concepts are going to be best conveyed in a 3D or 2D or maybe both or maybe neither approach. We just want to make sure we're using the best tool for the task, and we can't do that until we identify all the tasks. The question of whether a scene is best done in 2D or 3D is going to be down to both the limits of the specific apps you have access to and our limitations or abilities when using them. Two motion designers can look at the same boards and see radically different technological approaches, but here's what I was thinking when I put this all together. First, I wanted to go from a circular silhouette chopped into strata and turn that into stairs. We could just push these shapes horizontally, change their paths, and then they become rectangles. But then I thought this could be something much easier to do in a real 3D context because we can literally just set up the illusion and then orbit the camera around it. We can accomplish the move from one frame to the other with just two keyframes and a little bit of setup time. And if we really want to animate those wedges moving relative to each other, I'm pretty confident that we could use some fields and effectors in Cinema 4D, even the light version, to get even more control over this thing. So I'm going to label that 3D in my notes. Next, I want a ball to bounce up the stairs. If this were a corporate video, maybe this means something like project management or stakeholder buy-in. None of that is important, but this one is kind of a toss-up. We could do it in 2D, we could do it in 3D. It'll likely take the same number of keyframes to make it happen in either. So maybe if we look at the next scene, that'll help us best understand which method to use on this. I want to transition from these steps to a random alignment of the rectangles and then maybe spin or twist around those to turn it into a block of some kind. To me, that all seems like it's best to make these bits in 3D since we can really leverage effectors and fields to make this kind of movement happen procedurally. But going from the steps we made or the offcuts of the circle into stairs that were revealed to be long rectangles, eh, that's a bit of a tricky thing to solve. So maybe this is better done by making a new and separate 3D scene that just happens to match the composition of the stairs. So the connective tissue between these two 3D scenes might as well just be a 2D one that can bridge or connect them. And finally, we need to go from this rectangle back to the circle and I want to stretch and squish this thing in order to get there, which to me is probably best done using deformation effects to bring us back to that starting frame. But, 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 before we leave this planning phase, it's worth noting, maybe for someone else it makes way more sense to do it all in 2D, or maybe it makes way more sense for someone else to do it all in 3D. The ways of seeing and solving these problems is really subjective and based on the experience and perspective of the designer approaching it. Someone coming from a traditional animation background might say we should just draw every frame. If this were a large project, this is also where you might look at parceling out the work for individual scenes to specific staff or freelancers. But in this case, it's just me and this Dell XPS laptop, which of course is a smooth transition to talk about this video sponsor, smooth transitions all over the place here. If you're going to be taking on these kinds of 3D tasks, you're going to want to get your hands on some hardware power. That's why I'm very grateful to the people at Dell for hooking me up with this little XPS laptop with an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3050 GPU in it. Creating this tutorial in the project file, I was bouncing back and forth from After Effects to Cinema 4D and back and forth, and this little buddy handled it all quite nicely. I think a lot of that is down to the efficiencies of the NVIDIA Studio drivers and their optimizations across many, many creative apps. 
A lot of development has gone into making a smooth and stable experience for creative work. Leveraging all the GPU accelerated effects in After Effects, using the Cineware plugin to drop 3D scenes right into our timeline, and incredibly fast previews make this kind of project possible. Swapping between very hardware intensive apps makes this kind of integrated workflow a snap, and I'm happy to say that the XPS line has really helped out with that. So if you're in the market for some new hardware, please check out the Dell XPS lineup with NVIDIA graphics in the link in the description. I hope you'll like what they have to offer. Big thanks to Dell and NVIDIA for sponsoring this tutorial. When tucking into this kind of project, I highly recommend doing the hard part first. And I don't just mean the difficult part, even though that is important too. Doing the most difficult task first can help since you might be bridging them together with simpler ones later. But also, you should try to lock down the least flexible components first, the most brittle, the least malleable. Since I know I'll be stitching these all together in After Effects and doing all my 2D work in there, the least flexible elements in this case are the 3D scenes. Now, I'm doing these in Cinema 4D because I also want to leverage that kind of built-in integration that C4D files have in After Effects. As you can see here, we can just import them as a form of footage. Then we can interact with those scenes using the Cineware effect, which we'll get to later. But it was worth touching on now that if you're using Blender or Maya or Unreal or some other 3D app, you may need to instead render off an image sequence, which would definitely make them the least flexible part of the process. So let's have a look at how those Cinema 4D scenes are organized. And if you want to skip ahead, there are chapter markers in the description if you want to get right into the 2D part. First off, going from a circle to stairs. Now I'm using Cinema 4D Lite, which comes with newer versions of After Effects. It's already on your machine probably. And while it has lots of good tools, it only has a small fraction of what the full 3D suite offers. So some of the methods you're going to see here are less than optimal, but to make this layered circle into stairs, I first need to model those wedges. I'll start the scene over from scratch so you can follow along if you like. I'm going to first make all the rectangle shapes that we might want out of cubes. We dial in the desired size in the attributes window. Then to make this conform to the inside of the cylindrical shape, we just make a cylinder, dial in the size and orientation, and make use of the bool object. This lets us combine two things we put inside it, or subtract one from the other, or in this case, only take the intersection of the two things. It's not particularly robust and can cause some issues with geometry, so I would advise anyone using the bool to play around with the subdivisions of the elements within to increase the fidelity of the parts that are being intersected. But this is a quick and dirty way to get the shape we're after, and it's a feature we do have access to in Cinema 4D Lite. To make the rest, I'll just copy and paste that first bool a few times, change the position of the rectangle in each till we have the whole shape filled in. Now I want to dynamically control how spread out these get on the Z axis. So ideally, I'd like to use the MoGraph module. We have access to a part of that through something called the Fracture object here in Cinema 4D Lite. So I'm going to drop all my bools into one of those. This will let us apply effectors to the whole system inside that Fracture object. Before I do, I want to move the axis of each of my bools into their middle center. This will make controlling them individually easier. So access the axis mode up here and just move each of those into to the middle center of each, done and done. Now I need an effector for this system. We only get to play with a couple of them, but they're good ones. I'll go here and drop a plane effector into this project and make sure that it's listed in the fractures list of effectors. You might need to drag it in here. And right away, we're applying a change in position to everything. I'm going to make sure that we're applying the right change in position. Then I need to apply this differently to each of the parts. So I'm going to use a field to help me out with that. Fields are a way of saying who gets how much of a given an effector. So I'll use a linear field, make sure it's lined up going the right way, and that's as tall as the whole stack of objects. Then I can dial in the amount so everything lines up. I want the parts to move away from the middle of the group, so I'm going to drop keyframes on the minimum and maximum values inside the remapping tab here. By pushing both of those to 50%, you can see that we collapse it all together. Then by moving ahead in time and relaxing them back out to zero on the minimum and 100 on the maximum, it expands back to our desired state. Then I'll probably move that model back into the middle of the thing here, moving the entire fracture object. And now it's just a matter of getting the camera to do what we want. This is another lovely tip when considering blending 2D and 3D things. If we use a parallel camera that removes all the perspective from the image, objects no longer seem larger up close and smaller far away. That means if we rotate from one angle to another, it's going to be completely flat. It's a fun, kind of unique feature that we have access to here. Even the longest focal length of a camera still has some perspective in it. But I've made the parallel camera, I move it a little bit away, just so there isn't any clipping of the scene objects, and then I stick that into a null. The null is like a group, and it's going to rotate around the middle center of the scene to give us that nice shift and reveal our little illusion here. 
It takes only a couple of keyframes to do, so in the end, our dope sheet looks pretty sparse. That means fine tuning the curves and timing is going to be a lot easier. You can access your curves and dope sheets from the window menu. And with the dope sheet itself, you can see everything that we put keyframes on. And if you twirl down even further, you can adjust the value graph of these property changes. If we tried to fake this kind of thing in 2D, just imagine how many properties and keyframes we would need. One final bit to do here is to drop on some materials. These are nothing to write home about. They're just simple gradients on the color channel. They're set to use the 3D linear mode of gradient, meaning the gradient exists in 3D space. Now we've got all the beats that we need for this scene, since we're going to let a 2D scene take over from the point where it becomes stairs. The second 3D scene is manipulating an array of rectangles using effectors. As you saw previously, that's a great way to apply changes to a group of things. Here in the final file, you can see several effectors being applied and the fields that limit or control them being animated through as well. I'll just run you through them one at a time so that you can get a sense of what's going on. We have a similar type of camera setup and move like the scene from before, rotating that null around twisting so the camera orbits and spins. Then we are pushing a linear field through from one side to the other. So on one side, none of that plane effector is being applied. And then once it's on the other side, the full strength of that plane effector is being applied to all the units. And the two things that it changes are the scale, turning these rectangles into a more square shape, and the rotation, giving them a 90 degree twist. At the same time, we've got this random effector here that is reducing in strength. A random effector can apply randomness to properties. That's being applied to the X position only. As the strength decreases, the randomness is going away. All these things together create this rather pleasing realignment of the shapes. These are simple things to do with a few fields and a couple of keyframes here because we have access to these procedural systems. And remember, all we need to do is land on this final frame like our boards have instructed us. Don't worry about what comes next because we can dovetail that into another scene. We're only looking at making little chunks and we'll knit those chunks together in the next steps. I hope that this kind of explains at least partially how those chunks are made and I would encourage you to look deeper into the technicalities of Cinema 4D if you're interested or if you want to know more about what we might do in Cinema 4D Lite, maybe let me know in the comments and I can talk more about it in future tutorials. For now, let's talk about how how we match them up with 2D parts and get this all connected. When we are importing these things, if you are bringing in an image sequence, it'll be treated just like footage. But we're going to be enjoying the added flexibility of the Cineware plugin. This way, if we do make a modification to those Cinema 4D scenes later, we don't need to wait on another render. I recommend first dropping your Cinema 4D files into their own compositions. This will make comps that are the same frame size and frame rate as the Cinema 4D scenes and allow you to compartmentalize some of the work. Now, we need to talk about some of the various settings of the plugin. By default, it looks kind of like a mess. But if I change the render to current, you can see the same thing as if you rendered a frame right out of Cinema 4D. You may want to work in a draft version for faster playback if you're just working out motion and then switch to current for the final render and look development. There are many particulars in here, but of interest to me most is the multi-pass section. If you turn this on, it's going to give you access to the various individual passes that come out of Cinema 4D. If you wanted to layer on many copies of the Cinema 4D in here, you could then tweak and blend the various passes like ambient occlusion and the global illumination that we added in. It's a great way to tweak your image to taste here where you might be making other compositing choices. I'm just going to turn this to the RGBA image though so that we can enjoy that alpha channel. That's the a of RGBA. You may not need to use an RGBA pass if your current image, that current renderer image, is already looking correct with good alpha bounds. Occasionally, because of compositing tags in Cinema 4D and objects like sky, background, and other environmental things, you can sometimes see an opaque black background instead, or sometimes you'll see a really thin one pixel border when you're really hoping to see a nice clean alpha layer for the image. The RGBA pass can sometimes be a way to get around those funky things. Maybe you need it, maybe you don't, but give it a try if you run into the those troubles because we want that alpha channel so these elements can now float peacefully in space with no background pixels to get in our way. This will make our later steps a lot simpler. Also, since we're trying to match up the ends of this thing, we should mark in this composition where things have come to rest. I gave us a nice 10 frames of padding back in the Cinema 4D scenes. Maybe that's a bit much, but if we want to do any cross dissolves or anything else, having a few extra frames couldn't hurt. Or we want to freeze frame those parts and, and use them elsewhere. It can be really helpful to have those extracted frames to help us line things up or just use them as reference. And we might even use them as a component in the 2D scenes. I say might knowing that's exactly what we're going to do next. 
So what do we have to do to match these two shots up? If we look at our storyboard, the thing we want to do is have a circle bounce up the stairs. We're going to use a little bit of motion of that ball hitting the stairs to camouflage the change. To set up the scene, I've just split off the ends of each of the 3D compositions, frozen their frames, so we have two static images to play with. Then I pre-compose those two ends together to give us this nice discrete composition to work in. Since I want each stair to wobble, I've masked out each of the stairs in each freeze frame, which gives us a total of 10 stairs. The first stair before and after, the second stair before and after, and so on. Then I'm going to terminate one layer and start the other layer when they're moving, letting the movement disguise that switch. This is a very common technique, using a fast motion to hide that one thing has changed into another thing. Now, this may be overkill because we're showing the technique five times, once on each stair, but it gets to another point that we're gradually changing from one image to another rather than changing the whole image all at once. Another little detail that can help is this little color change. If we just clicked from one stair to another, the difference is going to feel a little bit wrong that something has shifted. So we can lean into it and pull attention that something is changing. The change is now motivated rather than hidden. Speaking of reasons, in this comp, I'm just putting the stairs in motion. There's no ball hitting them to motivate that motion yet, but we can at least have the beats that we want for this very unrealistic bouncing movement. So getting something to seem like it's bouncing up the stairs would be a snap. That takes place kind of one layer outside here in the assembly composition, but why would we do it here? Well, mostly to illustrate another concept when matching 2D and 3D scenes together, and that is having some overlap. This ball enters the frame while we're still resolving this 3D turn, and it leaves as we're entering another one. There's a few frames of overlap between those. You want this kind of bridging element to overlap the discrete scenes so it feels like they flow into each other. Hard divisions are really going to stand out, so anything you can do to blur when that changeover has happened is going to help. Let's have a look at the second 2D scene and see what we can learn from that. Remember, we're making a loop, so the last frame needs to flow into the first frame. It's lucky that we happen to have the first frame right here, frozen and duplicated and moved to the end, so we have to get these two things to match up. Again, we're making use of that cutting on action, swapping between them at the fastest point of their rotation, but before that can happen, we need to change a few aspects to make the first thing a lot more like the second thing. It has a different shape, there are some gradients that are backwards, it's perpendicular, the scale is different, and while you might encounter a situation like this where the transformations are many, we can apply those same principles to try to make an easier transition. The first I want to talk about is overlapping action. I'm using a matte layer here that's a rounded rectangular shape that shrinks into a circle while also changing the scale, while also changing the texture a little bit just by sliding these layers around underneath. Now, if left on their own, that would feel really robotic and mechanical, all these things happening at the same time. So we've layered on here by parenting this mess to a null and bring in an adjustment layer with some warping, some complementary motion to cover up that robotic feeling. The subtle wobbling of the scale helps this change feel a little more impactful, and even better, we lead into it with these warping changes. The takeaway here really is that when we have lots of changes to make, we can make them less noticeable by using other layers to help control and add more movement in here. This also lets us preserve the technical thing that has to happen while adding some details that won't impact the final composition in a destructive way. And really, that null and that adjustment layer kind of start at default and end at default. Everything they're doing in between can get wacky, so long as we return to that baseline, we're going to be in good shape. It all wraps up as the rotation, that most critical part, takes place. The rotation will hide that final swap as it's overlapping with some of those distortions happening. There is a fair amount of timing to get right. But as you can see, by separating these things out and by having them overlap, it's a much smoother transition. We hide that anything untoward has happened at all. And maybe all of this builds on that same principle, but it's good to see it in the macro as well as the micro. Once we have all this as a through line, I'm going to take all of those 2D and 3D parts and pre-compose them so we can turn it into a nice, big, immovable chunk. Then 
You know, take that large complete unit and give it some more subtle moving and scaling, reframing parts as you like, or just having a slow push in and out. This keeps everything in constant motion, even if the frames where we might have a hold or we're still for a little bit longer than needed, it can help hide the cuts even more just to have this subtle movement overall. Also, comping in a background that is separate from this hero asset can be really handy. There's also a great place to drop on an adjustment layer and do some tweaks to the color and contrast, maybe layer on some noise. By applying these things to the complete piece, instead of inside the individual elements, we're able to add some harmony to them. Maybe even drop on a force motion blur on here if you like, which can help with that feeling of speed. Even though these are disparate elements, seeing them with a harmonious level of motion blur can make them feel more cohesive. Finally, since we're treating this 2D to 3D flow as a singular element now, you might even duplicate it and use it to create colored shadows or highlights under the original. Here I've just really blurred it out, set it to add and use the curves and its opacity to kind of blend it in just right. But having this kind of color spill again just adds this illusion that this is a cohesive thing. It's more of a trick than anything else. Things aren't actually turning from one thing to another. One scene ends, another begins, and we're using these techniques to make it seem like a cohesive thing. And I hope that this tutorial has mostly felt like a cohesive thing as well. I hope this has given you some ideas about how you might leverage 2D and 3D techniques to get the best of both and combine them together. While we certainly didn't cover all the ways we might mesh these things together, I hope this is enough to get you started. If you have any questions about these kinds of things, please do let me know in the comments and I'll try to help you out. And if you enjoy learning this kind of thing and you want to see more of it, make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you'll see all the new tutorials when they come out here. If you want to connect with me on the internet, please find me on Twitter and Instagram at EC Abrams. When you make something cool with these techniques, I would love to see it. So please tag me in the posts or tweet it at me. I'm always happy to see what you make with these ideas. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, stay creative, be kind to each other. Bye for now.